What I was going to do is, for a little while, I'd like to give you a, um, an overview of the project on which this was based, which did involve, uh, um, in the end, uh, to be uh, the largest in-depth interview study of long-married people ever conducted, um, with an average length of marriage of about 43 years. So I'd like to tell you about the study and kind of how I got into it, if that's all right. So I. But rather than completely brief, I may go, you know, 20-ish or 20 um, the minutes, but, but do feel free to interrupt. Um, and I wanted to introduce you to some of the participants in the project because we have some great videos of them and try to give you an idea of, of, of uh, the flavor um, of, their, um, of their wisdom on this topic. And so I would say, uh, you know, to begin, that this project um, for me was one of the most extraordinary of my academic career. I, uh, um, just on a personal level, to expand on what Sil said, about 10 years ago I had something of a revelation uh, that after 25 years as a gerontologist, I realized I was studying and focused almost exclusively on the problems of older people and old people as problems. So I was studying things like chronic pain, uh, elder abuse, dementia, um, and nursing homes. It actually began to seem like I was rewriting the book of Job for old people, basically. And that's what our society does as well. It treats people as old and sick and frail, and now they're busting the federal budget to boot. You know, it's this notion that they're problems. And at the same time, I was meeting in my work dozens of happy, healthy, vibrant, energetic people in their 80s and 90s and beyond. And I was also reading research, which I don't talk about um, much here, but I will say it you know, briefly. Um, and you may have read it because David Brooks recently did a column on it. There's really sound research showing that, that if you use regular survey methods, older people are happier than younger people. So they report higher rates of well-being, uh, you know, that the last 10 years or five years of their lives were the happiest period of their lives. And so I began to ask myself, what's that all about? And the idea hit me is, could we go to the oldest Americans, who in the book I call the wisest Americans, um, and find out uh, what they know about living a happy, healthier, and more fulfilled life that young people don't. And in part, you know, um, what we forget that, that it's only been the last hundred years or so that people have ever gone to anyone other than the oldest person they knew for advice. Oh, so this is a very natural sort of human thing to do. Uh, and also, I was really struck by how little research there was on it. Uh, th oh, there hadn't been any research, and that seemed like a great thing to, uh, uh, you know, to look at. So, so I used um, in these studies uh, uh, good, sound social science methods, um, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and from hundreds of interviews, all, um, all told, it was um, um, interviews with uh, s over 700 older people. I distilled what I've called these lessons for loving. Um, and the other thing I'll say is usually as an academic, before my first book, which was sort of, which also used the same methods, and I want to say this from a Cornell perspective, everything else I'd basically ever written was usual turgid academic prose. And I consciously and deliberately chose this vehicle of a self-help or, or, or of an advice book because it seemed to be a way to get to people who might not actually otherwise consider aging or think about aging. So I really did this you know, deliberately to try to use these social science methods, but get it into a form that people might find useful as part of this goal of really um, enriching people's thoughts about aging. So I had an absolutely extraordinary time. Um, um, I had the opportunity to sit down with very old people. The oldest person in, in all these studies was 108 and was somebody who was really doing well. Um, my best quote from her, let's see, uh, when did I start my first job? I've always remembered because it was the day that World War I ended. Um, they, um, so, um, uh, and these, you know, they were profound, they were funny, and, and I got to ask them things like the, um, these questions about marriage and their core values and other issues. Um, before I go any further, I'd like to take a minute um, and give you a sense of what it was like to actually do this. Um, um, so you can have a sense of what it might feel like or what a very old person um, might say um, 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 in answer to these questions. And I started every interview, uh, even though it was a much more detailed and structured interview, every interview began with the question, 
Um, as you look back over your life, and in some cases, very long life, what are the most important lessons about love and relationships and marriage that you would like to pass on to younger people? And that started this whole um, a series of, of reflections. Uh, and the questions we used um, are not completely in the book. There are some, and if you would like the questionnaire, I can certainly get it to you. Um, and uh, one interview who stuck with me was a woman named Kitty, uh, who is um, 94 now, probably has turned 95. She had a very adventurous young life. Um, she was a wave in World War II, the Women's Naval Corps. She uh, was married for 60 years, and she was very candid that her marriage initially was very difficult. Um, her husband uprooted her and moved her to the oil fields. She, she was an urban person. She said, I left him in my mind, you know, hundreds of times. But she stayed together and made the relationship really work. And they had 20 or 30 really good years at the end. And I'll come back to her at, at, at the end of this presentation. But, but here's an example and a pretty typical one of how someone might answer these questions. So I fell footloose and fancy free. I was in uniform. The war was over. Everybody was happy getting on with their lives. And uh, I thought, well, I'll go out with Chuck, but it'll only be because he's good company. So I found out he was more than just good company. Be prepared to come into this for a lifetime. It's the most important decision you'll make in your life. And don't give up too easily. Uh, there are always surprises. And just don't give in to too much shock or having hurt feelings. Be sure to sit down and work it out with the person you love. Open up. <laughs> Loosen up. <laughs> don't take it too seriously. Um, and so that was the kind of thing, and, and let me share with you, uh, but, but I think you can see that there was, it's been a hard project to have end because this was so enjoyable. It's, um, it's a remarkable trip talking to some of these very old people and a little like entering a time machine at times. Um, and this will all then led me to this marriage advice project. Um, and let me just share a few things and then we can talk. One question I would like to touch on is uh, why should we consult um, the oldest Americans about love and marriage. And there would be several concerns about that. First of all, weren't their experiences too vastly different to even be relevant to young people? Uh, really, um, if you look at seismic changes in love and marriage, people today, unlike these elders, don't um, wait until they're married to have their first intimate experience. Many more women work outside the home. Um, rates of marriage have declined and people are getting married later and then on top of all this we have the internet and social media and I would argue that in fact um, in the famous words of the Humphrey Bogart movie that truly the fundamental things do apply that much of what they have to offer is extraordinarily relevant um, and let me say there were two there were a couple of ways in which I know this first I did a series of uh, focus groups in preparation for this book so um, those of you with Cornell connections, I met in the basement of R Ruloff Student Bar uh, with eight fraternity brothers. I met with young professionals in New York City, with women who were in book clubs, men, parents of young children. And the fundamental questions were identical. Uh, I asked them, what, um, what would you like to know from these very old people and very long married people? And the questions, I think, were almost identical to what you would find 100 years ago or 50 years ago or even in Jane Austen's time. How out of a couple of billion people do I select this one person with whom I can be happy for a lifetime? Um, what are the major ways that we can communicate better and avoid conflict or at least deal with it better? And most important, 
and something that I think the oldest Americans are uniquely placed to answer for us um, is how do we keep it interesting and lively uh, 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 over decades? So, you know, um, so how does a marriage stay this rich and sort of beautiful experience? Um, also, I want to say in terms of relevance, if you look at survey data, young people today, so uh, people in their 20s, want almost precisely out of marriage uh, that people have for as long as people have done surveys. Um, namely, almost 100% of people in their 20s, and these are fairly recent surveys, um, say they want to get married. Um, um, most of them believe that they would like to be faithful to one person for their entire life. So they, they strongly emphasize marital faithfulness, and they do view it as a lifelong commitment. So even though things are changing, young people are interested in marriage, there's no sense of marriage being dead. Um, and I think um, that's a critical point, and it's why uh, the advice of older people are so valuable. Um, and the final thing I do want to say at the risk of getting on a little soapbox is uh, there are certain advantages to looking back uh, over one's lifetime. Uh, it's not a mystery how things have turned out because they've already turned out. Um, and you can look back and reflect on it. But also, problems affecting young people today also affected these oldest Americans, but, in, but for them, it was worse. So it struck me as I was thinking about this project as absurd that as couples are struggling to keep their balance in the second worst downturn in American history, that no one was asking the people who went through the worst downturn in American history. So, you know, and there's so much relevant information there, it seemed important. Um, well, let me share just a little bit about how this study was done. If you're interested, I am very happy to respond to questions about it. But there were three, um, um, there were three main data collection efforts. Um, and even though the book isn't written like a social science study, all of the methods were sound social science. First, just to get the lay of the land, since there hadn't been much research on this, we did a self-report survey and folks could write in their lessons for marriage and relationships. But I really wanted an unbiased sample. Obviously, there's something that's going to be a little different from someone who feels motivated to write in their lessons about marriage. Uh, so with the help of Cornell's Institute for Survey Research, um, I did a true random sample survey uh, um, of the U.S. Um, where we contacted people by phone and then did in-depth interviews over the telephone. Um, I can't resist sharing one small anecdote, uh, you know, because um, what happened is you could be sitting in your living room if you were a 70-year-old or over, and, and, and somebody would call and say, hi, I'm calling from Cornell's Institute for Survey Research. I want to talk to you about your life lessons. And one man did say, uh, I'll tell you my life lesson is not to answer goddamn telephone surveys. Um, and, uh, but, uh, which, and of course our research assistant came running to us very quickly, you know, tell me about that. But in general, older people have very high rates of response to surveys, so it's a very positive thing. Um, another thing I wanted to do, um, there have been a few small scale st uh, um, studies of this, and if you look at books in the bookstore, either they are typically a small number or one, like a celebrity or a motivational speaker's account of their great happy marriage, or their psychotherapists who are writing about troubled marriages. Um, and I wanted really both pictures. I wanted people who were in long, happy marriages, but also I wanted people who wound up, you know, after three divorces, lonely and unhappy in later life. Uh, you know, the idea is that they would have good advice for people as to what not to do. Um, so, so it includes elders who encountered very serious relationship challenges as well as those uh, you know, who felt they were in very happy um, relationships. Um, another thing that characterized the study is we did what we say in social science was an oversampling of African American elders. And so they're overly represented because we wanted to make sure we had a very diverse population. Um, there's a real New York City focus of this uh, because I interviewed in one way or another, it probably comes to around 100 people from New York City senior centers or from other um, locations like that, in Chinatown, in the South Bronx, in Harlem. Um, and that got us a lot of in-depth um, information about an even more group, uh, diverse group. We also worked with an organization of older uh, gays and lesbians in New York City uh, and did special recruitment of long-term same-sex couples, which, as an aside, um, if I blinded the, the names and genders of our respondents, you would find essentially 
no differences at all between long-term same-sex couples and heterosexual couples in terms of the kind of lessons they offer. How they got there is a little different, but uh, it was um, remarkably similar. Um, so let me spend the rest of my time briefly. Um, you know, it's very challenging because there were hundreds of lessons and I distilled them down to 30. Uh, and I only want to take time to share just a few of them with you, but I'd like to give you the gist of it. And then, uh, you know, um, I would love to have your questions. Um, and I'd, really what I have done in trying to convey this is to identify a few core themes of elder wisdom. And honestly, doing all the data analysis of this many folks, perhaps it's wisdom of crowds or something along those lines, but there definitely are several overarching themes that very strongly relate to looking back um, from the end of life. So, you know, so I would say this kind of a lens through which older people see love and marriage. And, um, um, and then I'm going to give you a couple of examples under each one um, from this generalization. Uh, is that showing up there? The first thing is, and I discussed this in my first book, and there's a lot of research on this, uh, and I'll take a minute to share it. One thing, so, so if you ask yourself, what makes older people different from younger people? What's something that in terms of human development, of where they are on a developmental trajectory, what really makes them different? And the researchers have found that one thing clearly is the strong sense of a limited time horizon that a 20-something or a 30-year or a 30-something, all of you I'm sure have heard this, has a close friend die. And the person says, I'm gonna stop and smell the roses now. But two or three days later, they're back to doing whatever they were doing. Older people don't have that luxury. Uh, and it results in something that uh, social scientists call socio-emotional selectivity, which is a great term to use. But it basically says older people come to regulate their emotions better and they come to be more selective. Uh, so their sense of a limited time horizon doesn't depress them as much as it helps them make better choices. And one of the, of the, of the working hypotheses of this book is that younger people can benefit um, from this viewpoint. Uh, that by being aware of how limited their time on earth is, even if it's artificially making them aware, um, they too can make um, better choices. So, it's a, so this was a common theme the idea of time and taking the long view. Um, one of my favorite quotes is, as one woman told me, I don't know what happened, because the next thing you know, you're 100. Um, and that was really kind of a sense. Uh, the, old, you know, the oldest people um, were the most likely to say, I can't believe how quickly life passed and that sort of thing. So what would one do with that? Or what does that long view mean? Um, and just to give an example, uh, one of the strongest pieces of advice was one also where the elders um, refused to provide any wiggle room on. Um, and that was the idea of getting married based on a plan to change your partner. <laughs> they argued that this view was equally strong among all groups, African Americans, Hispanics, whites, gay people, straight people, uh, the 60-year-olds and the centenarians. Um, making your partner a self-help project is a recipe for failure. And it was also remarkable um, the vehemence with which people expressed it. So 80 and 90 year olds would, would either um, literally or figuratively pound their fist on the table and say, if you get married planning to change someone, you're an idiot or you're a fool. Um, and they actually even came up, you know, as I was going through this with sort of a top 10 list of things that uh, you may tell yourself about your partner that won't ever come true. Like, you know, after we're married, he'll lose that gut um, and I'll get him to the gym or she'll like my family, that sort of thing. Uh, but that's something, too, you know, that comes. Um, there were many others, you know. Um, yeah, she, uh, she hates my family now, but they'll grow on her, you know. Uh, they argue that this is absolutely um, critical, is to give up the sense of trying to change your partner. And that comes from their own experience of having done it and watching their children and their grandchildren. Um, a second one, I think, which also comes from this long view is, go, goes like this. One very, uh, um, I like to say, or, or I can say, uh, you know, that I have spent more time talking to very old people about sex than probably anybody else I've ever known. And they are extremely candid 
about the importance of a physical attraction early on in the relationship. It's not like they're looking for inner beauty only. Everybody said that the way they met their partner of many years, you know, there was a spark, there was a fire that ignited, but almost as soon as they said that, so almost in the same breath, and this happened over and over, um, the elders said, but there has to be something more. That there's no way that heart-throbbing passion and the physical and sexual attraction are going to keep the relationship going over the long term. So no sooner had they um, announced how important it was to have the physical attraction, they also wanted you to move beyond. If this doesn't morph into something else, if it doesn't take on the qualities of friendship, including uh, you know, the comfortable uh, um, ability to hang out, uh, the sharing of mutual interests, easy conversation, uh, positive and enjoyable interactions, you won't make it for over this long period of time. So essentially everybody described this transition for, uh, um, in which uh, the ratio of friendship to passionate love you know, becomes larger. Um, and not that passion ever dies out, but people felt that was important. Um, a second last, you know, this kind of second area is something also that I think is related to this idea of the long view. Um, and their concept around this is something that's also backed up by research. And there has been some really good research on this. So it's where elder wisdom uh, um, and research really map onto one another. One thing they told me, uh, not precisely in these terms, but, uh, um, but along these lines, um, is that marriage um, is made up of hundreds or thousands of micro interactions over, you know, over even the course of a given day. Um, and in each of those little interactions, people have the choice to be positive, cheerful, or supportive, or not. Um, I mentioned research, and there's been research around a, uh, the factor of 10, that someone's actually quantified, that it takes approximately 10 positive interactions to overcome a single nasty one in a relationship over the course of a day, say. This is so strong for them. They, they, uh, they say, you know, don't look at the big ticket items as much as doing, for example, small and positive, unexpected things for one spouse. Uh, do it, and they gave a whole range of examples. For example, doing someone else's chore. Um, if you have a rigid division of labor in your household, spontaneously do the chore of, of the other person. So, and one person said to me, um, if the dog is scratching at the bedroom door at 6 a.m. on a rainy morning and it's your partner's turn to walk the dog, get up and do it. It's money in the bank. Um, a number of women did say, and uh, they may have been quoting someone, but it was surprising that there were several of them who said that their husbands doing the dishes was the most powerful aphrodisiac they could think of. You know, the, the, that this concept of someone stepping in and doing things. Um, so they argue in terms of giving small gifts throughout the week or the day, and that um, the buildup of these positive gestures can have a transformative uh, impact on marriage. And this, again, was men... Um, uh, um, as well as women. And I think the third, and this I'll pretty much stop after this, is uh, you know, th the concept of lightening up. Um, and that comes um, very specifically um, from the view at the end of life. That, and, the re and, and I would say over and over, an enduring theme was, as you're involved in your relationship, relaxing, embracing humor, um, easy forgiveness, that these kind of things are stress busters that um, make for a very long-term relationship. And they pointed out, and especially people whose marriages had dissolved pointed out, that an oppressive heaviness would overtake the relationship. That there was sort of a grayness that would kind of move in. Um, many of them talked about something they called the middle age blur, or, or something along those lines, where you're so involved in child rearing and work that everything else in the relationship goes out the window, for example. So they argued that the way that you can get around some of these is to ask yourself or be aware of the relationship becoming grim and serious and the fun um, leaving it, where sort of nothing is ignored and everything is taken seriously. And, and so one piece of that um, was to um, ask yourself if it's worth it. And now this may sound a little like a cliche, but, but having heard it you know, from 700 people, um, when you ask yourself the question, is this argument going to make any difference to me um, when I'm 80? The answer is almost certainly no. You know, it's just not, you know, that, and their point 
uh, after eight or more decades of living and six or seven or more decades of marriage is a, is a fundamental point the, that most of what husbands and wives get in arguments or fight about is simply not worth it. It's like the Seinfeld line. It's mostly about nothing. It's someone being irritated or upset for no reason. So the idea is to balance that specific disagreement against love for your partner. And let me show you one more. Um, this is Paul. And the one thing that you need to know is Paul is 90 and his wife Blossom uh, is, uh, is 91. Um, so she's a year older, as I, if I'm recalling correctly. And uh, it makes something interesting in terms of what he says. I'm glad that I go along with almost anything Blossom wants to do as long as there's no danger involved. Well, if your spouse says something that would anger you, I would say swallow the anger unless, as I said, there's danger involved. You can't be angry and shoot your mouth off, as they say. Now, one of my, yeah, he is. These ones you're seeing are, oh yeah, they're, we don't want to say the name because of confidentiality purposes, but, 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 but that's correct. Uh, so these are in pseudonyms? Uh, no, actually, these are their first names. First names. Um, I, you know, I neglected to ask what Blossom might want to do that was dangerous. Uh, and, uh, but that's a, re that's a regret. Uh, yeah, actually, I will say, by the way, uh, um, everybody did give complete permission um, to use their interviews. And this was a study, unlike a lot of the ones that we do scientifically, um, where people weren't promised confidentiality. Oh, so they were told that, uh, that someone could recognize them by their quotes. Still, uh, I, we still do use pseudonyms in the books. So all the names in the book are pseudonyms uh, that are chosen by a random name generator. Yes, there is such a thing. Uh, and, uh, and I typically use only the first names of folks in the videos, even though they did um, agree to do it. So I think, you know, that's, uh, there's that sense. And uh, I, you know, like among some other ones, uh, uh, this notion of giving up grudges. Uh, I heard as if it were part of a data bank that everybody over 75 has access to, the expression, don't go to bed angry, over and over and over again. And this is what, you know, I would make the point that even things that these folks said that sounded a little like cliches, if I drilled down into them actually had sort of an interesting or unusual aspect to it. But I would guarantee you, if you chose a person um, over 75 and said, give me your three top lessons for a good marriage. I'll bet you almost anything that one of those three is don't go to bed angry. So I really wanted to understand what actually that was by about, you know, the 200th time I'd heard that statement. Um, and I understood that it really is this concept of not holding a grudge. Um, as you would talk to them, it was, they, they pointed out that going to bed angry is a warning sign for a great relationship danger. Um, and that is holding grudges over days or for a long period of time. And their argument is there are fewer things that are more sure to extinguish the spark of marital happiness than a simmering fight that continues over days or weeks. Um, but one woman uh, who was 92, married to a 93-year-old man for 71 years, um, said something that really stuck with me, and that was an image of cleaning out each day. She said, um, clean out each day as it comes along. Um, try to clean out each day um, so when you shut your eyes at night, you've cleaned out everything. Um, and that was the sense of it. Um, and, let me comp um, and let me finish uh, you know, by saying uh, that we were talking about this a bit earlier before we started our session, but uh, there are many hopeful uh, things in this study for me. Uh, and I think it's why looking at long married elders was so valuable. It is not that everything is so wonderful. Many of the people I interviewed are dealing with health problems, struggling with other issues. But, and that marriage is hard for a lifetime, there's no question, but for a lot of people, it truly was a sublime experience. Um, something that even as a writer, I usually don't have that much trouble writing about, but it was very difficult almost to convey, you know, how good this is for older people 
and that it is a realistic possibility for younger people. So I think that, um, that's one theme. Um, and I want to leave you with one example of this hopefulness, because one thing a number of the elders did say, uh, you know, is don't give up on love. And I did a number of interviews in assisted living facilities, and it was really surprising um, how many people found a new partner. Um, I want to come back to Kitty, uh, who you'll recall, you know, had had this um, a difficult but then ultimately very satisfying marriage. Uh, she cared for her husband at the end of his life. Um, uh, she moved to New York from the, um, from the West Coast and, uh, and really thought this phase of her life was, all, w w was over. And here's, uh, here's what she told me, and this was one of my favorite uh, you know, discussions I had. Oh, yes, I had a fabulous boyfriend. <laughs> Suddenly, this fellow appeared from nowhere, a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn. And he's the, really the nicest man I've ever met. I'm older than he is by five years. They call, the young people call me a cougar. So cougars don't get married. He's 88. I'm going on 94. <laughs> I mean, it depends on what you're willing to bring to the relationship. And he's been so great to me that I feel so fake, so grateful, really, so grateful. And uh, it's pretty wonderful. Love at any age is terrific. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, um, and let me stop there. Um, you know, happy to answer uh, any questions. And the other thing is, if you're interested, you know, a lot of this. Okay, I will say one last thing, and then I promise I'll stop. This um, this is part of this overall um, a much longer term and much more extensive project called the Cornell Legacy Project, where now we, I would guess, we've conducted um, some kind of data collection. Uh, about uh, the life wisdom and the practical advice of very old people, probably on sort of 22 or 2300 people by now. So if there are other questions uh, around, you know, um, these kinds of sort of aging and advice issues more generally, I'm happy to answer them. Sure. Um, you had said that some of the people you talked to were divorced and some of them have had many marriages. Can you give a percentage? How many were had long marriages, and how many were divorced or widowed or in new relationships? You know, I can, and I I should have had some of those slides with me. Wait, I, can I can't quite later. do. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I can't quite do it off the top of my head. We, but it's a very good question. In our national survey, we began that survey only interviewing people who were currently married, um, and that actually was a very. Uh, uh, so it, it, it's why we had actually not only long married people, but people currently long married, because we didn't want everything to be retrospective. Yeah. I would guess that around half of the interviewees were currently married. Uh, in some cases, uh, they had been divorced and remarried. Uh, and probably a third-ish were widowed. Um, and then the rest of were, I mean, it might have even been half and half ish um, a widowed and divorced. I can find out exactly. But, uh, uh, yeah, but as I said, uh, we really wanted uh, some people who were widowed because we also asked them how they adjusted and, and, and if they had advice for younger people. Uh, and for folks who were divorced, a big question that, that we asked them was is there something you would advise to young people who are thinking of splitting up? Um, anything you could have done uh, that they didn't do? Again, these were all the questions. It wasn't looking at correlations. Uh, between certain characteristics and how long people were married. It was really, what do you think someone ought to do? Um, and so I wanted actually widowed and divorced people for that. And did you make compare at all by marital status or, and I, I would find that those conclusions where? But th th that's another good question and it lets me sort of talk about, you know, the nature of the study. So even though the data were collected in these formal ways, I um, went back to an earlier phase of my training, and the way this is done is really qualitatively and narratively. Um, so we did broad coding of categories, but a lot of it is me as the social scientist reading these again and again um, and coming up with sort of these broad categories. So a lot of those kinds of comparisons I would typically do, um, we really haven't done. 
Um, I can do them in this study, but the, and um, I shouldn't say that we haven't done them. But, but I will say that one of the overall observations from, say, looking at racial differences or looking at regional differences uh, is that the lessons, the actual top lessons, are almost identical. There's very little variation. So, um, you know, between, say, uh, the same-sex couples and heterosexual couples or, you know, um, black elders and white elders, what's really different is how people got there. So... Uh, gay male couples very often said, uh, you know, you, um, you have to be resilient, uh, you know, uh, you have to get through these difficult times, and often their reference point, say, for example, was the AIDS crisis when lots of their friends died. And African Americans would come to a similar point, but it often was a result of discrimination they may have experienced. So even though life experiences were different, what's remarkably similar are these core of lessons. It's why I felt kind of sort of confident about offering them. Great question, sure. Um, I wonder, among the people who are widowed or divorced, was there, and who did not remarry, was there a reason they gave for deciding not to remarry? Uh, you know, there, there, that's also a good question. I, I, I would say there are three different factors. There, were, there was a core of people who had been divorced who really didn't want to do it again for whom either they decided that they were the kind of person who shouldn't be married. And that's a lesson, by the way, that didn't make it into the book. Uh, because, of course, if this book didn't, the, the one thing which the book doesn't have in the project is anybody who has voluntarily never been married. So, so essentially everybody had some experience of marriage. But, uh, but there were people who really decided on, on an individual level that this was not for them. And despite their worldview that marriage is a good thing, a surprising number said it's not, necessarily for, it's not necessarily for everybody. It's kind of a discipline. It can be tough. It can be hard. If you're not the right kind of person for it, like maybe you shouldn't do it. Uh, and so that, um, that was one thing. You know, a second difficulty is really older women in particular have trouble finding partners. So, and um, may I digress just for one thing to say? I mean, one of the things I learned in this book, in this study, is that many older people are very sexually active, or at least have a lot of sexual interest. And their problem is mostly the, the, um, not having a partner available. Um, for the married older people, or older people who were in partnerships, they, um, they described you know, their intimate lives as fulfilling and sometimes even more fulfilling um, than in earlier years or when they were so busy with everything else. Um, you know, the quote I, I love is the 75-year-old who said, for us it's not procreation, it's recreation. Um, somebody else said, it's a tasty side dish, it's not the main meal anymore. Uh, but it was very important to them. But really the problem for a lot of people in terms of not getting remarried, especially for women, is... Uh, you know, the men aren't there demographically. Um, and that's compounded by the fact that, that men tend to marry women who, who are younger than they are. So, um, but yeah, you know, I, but I would say the most striking thing was there were a lot of people who'd had a very bad first marriage and a very good second one. Um, and that's where I think a lot, of the, a, a, a lot of the interesting insights come from. Ah, where would we find these insights? Oh, uh, well, that's a lot in there. Okay. Um, in the book, it, it, you know, we... Um, um, there are a lot of examples throughout the book of people. Uh, I, I think in the, in the chapter on communication was a big one where a lot of people felt that uh, their first marriage dissolved because they were just simply unable to talk to one another. Um, and in the intervening years, they learned how to do it. I, I actually give the example of one couple who got divorced and then um, remarried a half century later and are having a wonderful time, and they argued it was because they learned how to talk to one another. Was there a difference between how people related to their marriage looking back as to like how they felt about the way their children had turned out, now their children are older, maybe they're presidents of universities, maybe they're incarcerated? Do they view their marriages differently based on how their children came out? That is a really interesting topic, and it kind of actually blends um, some of the work I did um, for the first book um, and this one. You know, I don't think how children turned out is incredibly important to older people. 
I mean, it, it is, and that this is actually from other research I do. A lot of the other research I do is on parent-child relations, as Francine knows, and um, um, is on parent-child relations in later life, and on you know parents having favorites or unfavorites. And there's no question that if you feel like your your children or a child um, haven't turned out well, it's a source of depression. It's a source of uh, you know, like an uncertainty and kind of a lack of completion in your life. I didn't see that permeate so much into the marriages as much as how, how having a difficult or troubled adult child persists as a source of stress. Um, and that, I think, to the extent that, that there are difficulties and conflicts in otherwise harmonious late life marriages, it's arg it still is, unbelievably, as it might be when the kids were little, arguments over children and different responsibilities for children, whether a child should come back and live in the house. Uh, so children permeate some of the discussion, even in adulthood, but it, didn't, um, it doesn't rank so much around their achievements um, as it does you know, children persisting as a source of stress. Uh, you know, this phrase, uh, um, we've done some research, and colleagues of ours have too, uh, that really shows, you know, the truth of the expression that you're only unhappy, that, that you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. Um, and that really does uh, persist in the later life. So, so I think it is, it, it, it can be very stressful for marriages. Um, you, know, it, you know, it's also true that negative things in general affect us more than positive things. So if you have one kid who's a college president and one who's, um, you know, who's um, living on a heating grate, um, it doesn't average out to one okay kid. You know, you, you, you focus on the difficult one. But yeah, you know, I wish actually in this study it would have been very interesting to ask them more about, uh, um, you know, the role of adult children in the later part of marriages, but we kind of ran out of room. I just think it's this project you undertook together and you could be you know, different feelings about the results and each other's contribution to the results. You know, that is so true. I mean, I, I, you, you're actually giving me a really good idea for a new study because um, that maps excellently onto the way that we know that people as individuals feel about their kids. You know, the, the, we did a paper called, you know, Pride and Joy, which is, if you know, really, the sense of being proud of your kid is really critical. However, how it affects uh, the couple is an interesting one. Uh, you know, it's very, what I would say the highest difficulty is, is with folks who remarry kind of later on and they're blending adult children. There were many arguments actually about, you know, how much to support them or one kid being a freeloader or that sort of thing. Uh, but I like that idea. If I can steal it, I'll use it later on. Oh, yours. There we go. <laughs> I'll read it up and steal it back. Sounds good. <laughs> Would your third book use these same people or are you building? Uh, you know, the, yes and no. The, uh, the reason why I actually used um, a subset of people from, my first, from this longer term project in this book um, um, for one very important reason, that's that I wanted uh, the voice of the World War II and Depression era generation. Um, and as we talked about earlier, they're running out. So in 2004, 2005, 2006, there were lots more of them. So I had more people who could say, for example, um, our country's been at war for the last 10 years and, um, and families are dealing with it. How did you deal with it in Korea or World War II in particular? How did you, it was mostly wives who held families together. Um, you know, how did you do it? Um, so yeah, but on the whole, I pretty much rely on new interviews. Uh, so for the next book, which I want to have be about uh, um, my work and career and sort of living a meaningful life, uh, the idea is to really focus, like you're talking about, on people 85 and older, uh, you know, to really try to get the sort of last message of the World War II generation. I can't believe our society is not making more about the fact that this generation is going to be gone, you know? Well, there was an awful lot um, of, about the great generation just in the last, you know, within the last ten years. But but not, yeah, but not so much, you know, I'm just feeling like a, the, the, there was a little D-Day and that kind of thing, but we're really talking about this being over. You know, so um. yeah, I feel like there's there's been an effort to reach out to war vets of that age, but maybe not necessarily just the general population. Yeah, well, you, well, you know, the one the, uh, the one thing in all of these venues that I do like to add that I think is really important is, you know, our society is in the midst right now, and and, and it's really why I've been writing these books. 
uh, the underlying moral agenda. Um, our society is in the midst of a really dangerous experiment. Um, and that dangerous experiment is the first society in history, the first time period where younger people have no meaningful contact to, to, with older people in their daily routine of life, except for intermittent contacts so with their own family members. So this is really the first time that in, in neighborhoods, in towns, in large extended families, that uh, young people are virtually divorced from the experience of older people and from their advice. And we live in the most age segregated society uh, so research shows that you're more likely to have a close personal friend of a different race than you are to have a close personal friend who's 10 years older or 10 years younger than you are. Um, and there was another recent study of people 65 and older that showed that they had had uh, the percent of, of people 65 and older who had had a meaningful personal conversation with someone under 30 was 20% in the last month. And if you exclude family members, it was 5%. So we are increasingly detached from older people, and I just think it's a huge mistake. I don't know quite how to put the genie back in the bottle. But, and that's really the underlying reason, is to try to see if we can convince younger people that there's valuable experience here for them. Well, I kind of wonder about the reverse, too, because I, uh, I thought it was interesting you mentioned in the beginning how although these lessons still apply, life is a lot different for young people. They're meeting on Match.com or social media. There's intimacy before marriage. Divorce is more socially acceptable. Did the people you interview have some kind of sense of how life was different for young people? And what did they think about it? Did oh. they just kind of shake their head at young people now? Or? No, they are, it's a great question. They are immensely uh, sympathetic. That they really think that it must be extraordinarily difficult you know, for young people. A lot of them met people in small towns or in neighborhoods. They feel like it, it, it must be extraordinarily uh, hard for young people um, in terms of mate selection. And by the way, uh, um, what the young people I interviewed, say, um, in New York City, they kind of agree. I mean, a lot of the single young people I know, it's not like kind of a sex in the city wonderful time. People are very concerned about this. And they have to watch, you know, their friends are disproportionately emphasizing wonderful lives on Facebook. So, so I think um, one thing they would say is like sort of, you know, really how hard it must be for young people. But there is an acknowledgement. They are not old fuddy-duddies. This is not, you know, the you kids get off my lawn thing. M um, many of them felt that things have changed positively in some ways. A lot of women, of the older women, are extraordinarily envious of younger women for their greater chances, um, ability to work, and more egalitarian relationships. Uh, um, that would be an example. Uh, or a lot of them did find that you know the rigid taboos around sex and other things as they were growing up was difficult. Um, but one interesting thing is many people talked about, especially women, what it was like to have the first intimate experience of your life, a be after marriage, and to realize that you were going to be married to this person your whole life. For some of them, they described it as very positive. It was like this year or two of you know sort of kind of getting to know one another. Uh, but I th I would say the majority of elders feel that it would have been better for them to have those experiences before marriage. A number of them said, and this was people of different political stripes, uh, that living together before marriage is a good idea. So they weren't a rejecting of modern life, but they um, do see things as being tough for young people in the world of love and romance. Maybe that's just me buying into the stereotypes, because I would have just thought, you know, the elders just kind of shake their head and, you know, say, all oh, the young generation, they're so messed up, they don't know how to do things. But it's, it's interesting that they really do recognize the challenges because things are different, but also some of the advantages that the um, younger generation has that they didn't. Yeah, no, no, I would, I would say that they seem really uh, pretty open-minded. You know, there were things that they were the most adamant about that I wouldn't have expected. And I put this in the book and I preface it half-jokingly is what I think is the most controversial thing in the book, they really, rec they really believe, even though many of them are now on the internet, that people should disconnect when they're at home. That your home should be this kind of haven in a heartless world, you know, um, where you really go and you um, erect a force field and the rest of the world can't get in. And many of the men, um, and some of these folks were high-powered executives, you know, kind of workaholics, viewed 
the inability of someone to reach them in their off time is so critical to their family life. And one guy said, oh, these poor people, you know. I mean, it just strikes, like, really that strikes them as something unfortunate. And I do think that's a life lesson. I've taken that to heart myself. I really do try to keep the phone put away more because they, um, these are people who had wonderful, successful careers and lived without it, you know. Uh, so I think it was that kind of thing. Um, other? Did you have anybody from an arranged marriage or what we used to call a shotgun marriage? And, and were their lessons uh, enlightening? I did. I, I did. In fact, I mentioned one of them in the book. Actually, she would be a very good interviewee for your, for your project someday. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give an example and then talk more generally. Yeah, the answer is yes. And interestingly, where, where it came up the most um, I was in the Chinese community, which we don't think of as formal arranged marriages. Mm -hmm. But as one woman um, was a very typical example, she said, you know, I was living with my parents, working in their restaurant or store, uh, you know, like my two aunties knew that there was a guy who was about to go back to Hong Kong to try to find a wife for him. And so they introduced us. She and many of the other ones, now it might be reconstructive memory, um, also folks from Indian um, families, that were generally positive about it. And what everybody said was that I could say no, but that the relatives did a lot of the vetting. They did you know, the sense of are we similar, are we going to get along, and then we could say yes or no, but a lot of the difficult groundwork was taken out of the way. and. Uh, now, now, it could be a selection bias, because these were all marriages you know, that lasted long. But uh, the folks who were in those marriages that were generally positive about the process, uh, you know, especially if it wasn't oppressive. But yeah, I, I would say, I mean, it wasn't a whole lot of people. Maybe between 10 and 15 of the folks had something that at least looked like an arranged marriage, where relatives you know, had done the initial selection. And uh, they, were, they were kind of positive about it. How about marriages forced by a pregnancy? You know, this was unusual in their age bracket. Mm -hmm. there, did, there definitely were cases of it. In almost every case that I can remember, it didn't work out well for them, or they, you know, it was very difficult. But you also raise another um, interesting point that I wanted to touch on. Um, pregnancy prior to marriage. I mean, is in general not a, I mean, this may sound obvious, you know, but isn't a good predictor of a long and stable marriage. And uh, one of the things that, that researchers have found in general, um, well, we have this idea uh, that half of marriages end in divorce. So we all hear that again and again and again. And, and it's actually not true. First of all, the divorce rates are going down, but for subgroups of the population, your chances are really good. And a subgroup of, of the population where it's really bad is people who bear a kid before getting married. Where your chances of staying together are really good, like 80%, are if you've got a college education and you get married in your late 20s and you aren't doing it because you're pregnant, so you've got about an 80% chance of at least making it for 20 years or more. So all those kinds of things, both with the elders and here, um, not having to get married, you know, but following a pattern that has you more, in, more kind of independent and knowing yourself, et cetera. Each, each thing leads to something else. I will say a, this, a very strong uh, recommendation, which seems so obvious. I didn't actually highlight it in the book, but it certainly is different. I would say the majority of folks said, wait to get married. Don't get married too soon. And many of them said it in this way. You know, I got married at 21. I wish I'd waited until, until later. I was too young. So this sense of choosing someone carefully um, and delaying marriage, you know, I mean, I should put that in the book. Well, it'll have to go in like a later one. Did that have to do with specifically waiting to consider marriage for later or like longer courtships with the same person? Like we date for so long now versus... It's true. Uh, you know, both, I think. Um, there were people, you know, who um, met and got married within a few months because the husband was going off to World War II. The witch, by the way, you, know, you then didn't see the person for two years and all you could communicate through was via letter, so that's pretty remarkable. I think uh, that people in general felt that they didn't know themselves well enough. 
And, and, and so one of these areas where they're envious about younger people is being out, experiencing the world. They definitely don't want someone to have a short courtship. They really say again and again, and, and that was actually in the first book, they say really choose carefully, wait, make sure you're absolutely certain. Um, and that was based on people who did it and people who didn't, who said uh, uh, that my marriage was way too rocky because I did it too quickly. So even though you know, the, the age of marriage is going up, I would say the vast majority of these folks think, think that's probably a good thing. You know, yeah, I, I hadn't thought about that. And, and that's something I did touch on in, um, in the first book. Uh, they say, you know, despite their own experience, choose really, really carefully. Uh, think twice, think three times, think four times, uh, and wait if you're at all uncertain. So yeah, I think they like that idea. Um, he said channeling the elders. Um, I say, I mean, like, I don't know that much about marriage. I just know all these people who do, you know, it's like. So you didn't get a sense that they, you know, got married young and they grew together? They said more. Oh, that's, that, you know, you, you are tempting me to contradict myself. Um, I'm just quoting my own puppy. So. That's, well, that is one thing, that's one difference between their time and our time. And at the risk of sounding contradictory, that is a point they make. Namely, and this was true even for me, uh, you know, in the 70s, people had much more of a sense, you know, that you would get married and then you would engage in your life together. <coughs> So, you know, the process of schooling and building a career and those kind of things you actually did with someone else. Every survey done now of 20-somethings and early 30-somethings shows there's almost universal agreement that you want things settled. You want your career settled, your education done, like maybe you want a house um, before you get married. They do think that younger people are missing out um, on having a partner in those important emerging adulthood transitional moments. Um, and that is, I, I think I do mention in there, that I, uh, the idea that you wait until everything is fixed and firm and ready is something, even if it sounds a bit contradictory to the wait and see, they think that younger people are missing something there. That, that was really valuable for them to engage in the struggle together. You know? and, and, yeah, that's a good question. I hadn't thought of it. Did you speak to any of the older people who were cohabiting rather than married? And that is mostly happening now, as, as, um, as you probably know. Women in their 60s and beyond who get involved with somebody, many of, especially in a case where a woman is widowed and an experienced being a caregiver, really don't want to be a caregiver again. And it's one reason why some of them choose not to get married. And that's both anecdotally and in some surveys that, you know, the idea of being married and being legally responsible in a caregiving situation is something that does make people, you know, hesitate. And many of the elders who got married did so, the, um, um, in this study, did so in a savvy way. They really carefully articulated, for example, how they would keep their money separate, you know, the, the, the inheritance to both families. A number of them did prenuptial agreements that specifically laid that out. People are are cautious about remarriage. At every point in the life cycle, men are more eager to get married right away, and they remarry um, very quickly. Um, uh, and, and there was some of that here, but I would say for both genders, there was a sense of caution about um, a legal remarriage. And now that people don't like have to do it unless they feel ethically you know, obligated to, um, it's an open option. But uh, yeah, I would say that there's, if not even just openness to cohabitation, but a number of people are doing the, it's got an acronym, you know, the, uh, exactly, living, um, apart, living together. apart together, uh, was for some folks, actually, yeah, actually that, that was more common than I'd expected, you know. Uh, but then you do, I mean, um, children are sometimes oppositional, you know, and worried and that sort of thing.